One, two, three, come on. Let's sing, come, let us worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. Oh, He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Yes, He has. He has done great things. Oh, Hero of Heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. And amen, you will do great things. Oh God, you do great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. Awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. Oh, we sing hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things oh yes you have oh yes you have we'll sing hallelujah and god above it all hallelujah and god unshakable hallelujah you have done great things you've done great heaven oh hero of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive break every chain oh god come on you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done Welcome to our home and our church at home experience. I know many of you are gathering as well and, and homes with others that you might have a, a church at home experience. And so whether you're just with your own family or with others uh, having a church at home experience, I want to prepare our hearts now for communion. And uh, as we do so, the worship team is going to lead us in a song here in just a couple of minutes. And, and when they do, just want to encourage you and those you're gathered with 
to take a moment to pray, acknowledge uh, what Christ has done for us, mention the name of Jesus as we uh, give thanks and praise for what He's done for us. And I want to kind of set that up for you by just reading from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. Paul, writing to the church there, says, For I received from the Lord what I pass on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as we uh, take some time, hopefully you've pulled together some elements there that you can use. I have a little cracker here that will symbolize the bread and uh, a cup of juice here uh, symbolizing the blood of Christ. Uh, hopefully you have those elements pulled together, something that can represent uh, the bread and the cup as you share in this time together. And may we... Uh, not only remember and give thanks for what Christ has done for us uh, as we acknowledge the, the bread and the cup, but may we also share in this time uh, acknowledging His promise to come again. And as we prepare our hearts, giving thanks for the forgiveness that is ours, and as we await His return. May God bless you as you share in this time together. Every chain will break I know 
church. I hope you're enjoying church at home. And like Pastor Bob said last week and this week during the update, we hope that you guys are able to invite some close friends or family over and experience church at home together and, and still have some fellowship that way. Uh, to keep up to date with all the things we have going on at our church, it's constantly changing just with everything going on. Make sure you like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, or, or just keep up to date on our website at TulareFEC.org. Uh, that's the best way to keep up to date with us and we're excited to hear from Pastor Bob this morning and, and what he has to teach from God's Word in our series, The Bible. Hey church, once again, it's uh, great to greet you in our home, and uh, as I said, I know many of you uh, have taken that step as well to, to meet together in a house church setting. Thank you for doing that, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that in the message. Indeed, these are crazy times, and certainly want to wish you a happy 4th of July weekend, and as we celebrate our freedoms and acknowledge the many ways that we've been blessed, uh, just aware is that we live in some crazy times right now, and so we have to continue to look to God and let God guide us in these times as we uh, continue to navigate this year. Can you believe it's July already and halfway through the year? How many of you are maybe thinking about asking your mom if that offer to slap you into next year is still on the table? That might be something to consider. Uh, it is indeed crazy out there. Be careful with all the statues being taken down. Uh, I know there's a new fear now that Pigeons may begin to poop on people at a higher rate, and so just be careful and uh, keep your eyes, as they say, uh, wide open, head on a swivel, be aware of uh, the reality. And as you celebrate the 4th of July, uh, certainly fireworks, you know, don't be like the guy who said, uh, on the one hand, I like fireworks, on the other hand, I have three fingers. So just don't, don't be like that guy, uh, celebrate and acknowledge God's goodness as we uh, uh, celebrate together. And uh, maybe it's time, maybe I just need to, uh, to get into the message. As we continue in our series, uh, the Bible and what the Bible has to say, how relevant it is, uh, I want to look at a message in Acts chapter 2 that focuses upon the early church and the reality that as things were happening, as God was moving in the early church, there were some adjustments that they had to make. I think it's some things that can be very relevant to us uh, in our day as well. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, is. Pentecost, the Spirit of God is falling upon the church, the birth of the church. Peter is preaching a powerful, powerful sermon. And in that message, he says, Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, we're told they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, What shall we do? Now, there's a good question. When 
Things are kind of crazy and chaotic and God is moving. What shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we acknowledge today, even as we find ourselves in the midst of struggles, and the question may be, what shall we do? Certainly we want to look to God and rely upon His Spirit to guide us, to to be with us, and to give us wisdom. Peter went on to say, the promise is for you, for your children, all who are far off, all who the Lord our God will call. And with many words, he, uh, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So when we think about, certainly as Peter looked out in his day, he saw a corrupt generation in need of salvation. And I think we can acknowledge today as well, as the Spirit gives us eyes to see our world, to see the world as God sees it, we too can acknowledge, indeed, there is great corruption, a lot of evil uh, in our culture, uh, but people that God wants to reach. Uh, Those who accepted the message on that day, we're told, were in the number of 3,000 came into the church. So let's think about that. So in the early church, the Spirit of God's moving, and Peter stands up and preaches in what he acknowledges to be a corrupt generation. And the church goes from 120 or so to over 3,000. They literally went, uh, became a mega church, in essence, in one day. And how did they deal with this massive change? How did they deal with this reality that God was moving, the Spirit was uh, speaking to people, drawing people unto God? Well, they established house churches. And as we talked about last week, as uh, during the month of July, we're going to not have services on our campus and our sanctuary. I'm going to encourage you to take these steps to, uh, to set up some house churches, simply inviting a friend, a family, a neighbor, a couple families in, whatever you feel comfortable with, and, and having a church uh, experience there in your home. And I believe this is important because as we continue to deal with the issues related to COVID-19, this ever-changing guidelines, um, it's important for us to acknowledge, um, not only is this an opportunity to take a step of faith, uh, open to a new thing that God may want to do in our midst, it's also an opportunity for us to step into this model that was certainly a part of the early church. Indeed, as we talked about last week, it's an opportunity to show love for our community. We have to be mindful of just this reality that we're dealing with in our community. And then as well, it's an opportunity to share the gospel. And so look for those opportunities when you can just share your faith, share uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ with others in your community. Now, as we take this step, I think it's important that we understand uh, kind of what's behind it and why we're doing this. Uh, I I know it can be confusing and and in the midst of already a lot of confusion, people may have questions, why are we, why are we doing this? I, I don't want it to be like the preschool teacher who, uh, who was teaching on the 4th of July and shared, you know, we celebrate uh, on this holiday because everyone is free. And a little boy raised his hand and uh, she said, yes. And he said, uh, teacher, uh, I'm not free. Um, I'm four. And so uh, <laughs> obviously we can begin to acknowledge that sometimes Uh, People can be confused about what we're trying to say. And I don't want that confusion to be uh, a part of uh, this step we're taking. See, I believe it's it's reasonable to assume that we're going to see some more uh, changes coming our way related to the church and guidelines, certainly in the the months to come. And we need to be able to move quickly uh, to communicate clearly about maybe what steps we're going to need to take regarding what's happening in our culture and the kinds of things we're having to deal with, whether it's COVID or, or other issues. And so when we think about that, uh, it's almost like, I remember growing up uh, in Kentucky, uh, we had snow days. I think around here in Tulare, we have fog days, but schools that kind of set up this understanding that there's the optimal plan, and then there we have these plans already built in. So when you communicate that there's going to be a change. And I think for us, obviously, plan A is always going to be meeting in our sanctuary, meeting on our church campus without any restrictions. Uh, plan B would be some variation of meeting in our church campuses Uh, but with some restrictions that we're having to deal with uh, because of COVID or other things. And then plan C uh, uh, could be a church at home experience that we understand we already have a connection with some families, some friends, and we can quickly begin to invite them to come and be a part of our church experience uh, there at home. So what did the early church do when they met at home? That's what I really want us to focus on today as we begin to establish these experiences. And hopefully all of you will at least take one Sunday in the month of July and and just try a house church experience so we can begin to evaluate and have discussion around that and see what God wants to do in and through this setting. So this morning, as we look at Acts 2, let's think about what did the early church do 
when they met in their homes. And I want to focus on uh, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. If you have your Bibles, let's read together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Word. Let's talk about what does it look like to become like the early church. And the first thing I would suggest to you, if we're going to study the early church and become like the early church, is it's about devoting ourselves to worshiping God. Clearly, uh, we see in that passage, they devoted themselves to something. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. Clearly, it's a focus on God, a worship of God. Now, when you're devoted to something, it means that you're focused on that particular thing almost exclusively. Like, like in marriage, uh, we understand to be devoted to, to one spouse, uh, for me to be devoted to Luann, meaning uh, that's significant in our relationship. And as we think about what it means to be devoted, we certainly have things in our culture that we can acknowledge that we are devoted to. Uh, just to get us some understanding of what it means to be devoted to something. For example, uh, many in our culture are devoted to making money or to getting rich or to impressing others. These are major themes within the American landscape of things that we're devoted to, to the exclusion of other things. We, we can be so devoted to these things that in many ways what we come to discover is what we are devoted to can easily become an idol. It can just begin to take over our lives. Sometimes we're devoted to sports teams. It's like I heard someone say the other day, can you believe it? We're in July and the Giants are undefeated while the Dodgers haven't won a game yet. I mean, I think maybe there's someone there that's just a little bit devoted uh, to sports as how they see things and interpret it. But sometimes even in our culture, especially in these recent weeks, we can discover how we can be so devoted to a political party or a political position or ideology and, and how it can begin to consume us and in ways as we think about our devotion. Now, again, my purpose in bringing this up is just to help us to greater understand what it means to be devoted to something and how we can be so passionately devoted to certain things in our world, in our lives. Certainly that was the case for the early church, but what's key is what they were devoted to. And so let's look at that together. Devoted to the apostles' teaching. And this was something, not that they had to do, something they wanted to do. And as they focus on the apostles' teaching, we might think of it in terms of they're focusing on God's Word. And as we've mentioned several times over the recent weeks, I hope that the change in schedule and some of the quarantining that's been a part of our lives in recent months has given us an opportunity to be more focused on God's Word, focusing on the teaching of Jesus. In fact, Acts chapter 5, verse 42 says, Day after day, now think about that, day after after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news about Jesus being the Messiah. So day after day, it was an important part. They were devoted to, they're focused on the Word of God. So let's take a moment as we acknowledge freedom and the celebration that this weekend involves with the 4th of July weekend and celebrating our freedoms. Let's think about something Jesus said and what something we might focus on and be devoted to. In fact, in John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He goes on later to say in that passage, If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So as we think about freedom, and certainly this weekend, I'm sure there's been a lot of talk about freedom Let's think about from Jesus' perspective and allow Him to speak in to this issue of freedom. You see, Jesus seems to be saying that the key to freedom, real freedom, is holding to His teaching. In fact, He would lay out, if you hold to my teaching, it means you really are my disciples, and then something's going to happen. You're going to come to know the truth, and then that truth is going to do something in your life. That truth will set you free. 
As I was thinking about holding to the teaching of Jesus, I was reminded uh, several years ago, in fact, it was June 18 of 2001. We had recently come to California, and uh, Luann and I were celebrating our 18th wedding anniversary, and for some reason, we had this crazy idea to climb Half Dome. Now, I know some of you may be familiar with Half Dome there in Yosemite National Park, and, uh, and just this reality that we were going to climb Half Dome on our anniversary. So I thought, you know what, having never done this, had really no idea what was going to be involved, uh, I thought, man, it'd be neat if we planned to renew our vows up on top of Half Dome, knowing that with the time change from Kentucky to California, that literally the time we would be there would be roughly the same time we were married some 18 years prior. And so I secretly pulled together some plans to, uh, to uh, have us have a friend of mine who was going to be there to, to do the vows and another friend who was carrying a ring for us. And we're just going to surprise Luann with this, with this celebration. What I did not know was that there was this thing called the cables <laughs> that were associated with the climb up Half Dome. In fact, later in the day, as we'd been hiking uh, for some time, we arrive at the base of Half Dome where those cables are. And I know many of you have probably climbed Half Dome. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I think we have some pictures here that will help you uh, for those of you who have not uh, maybe been there or know what these cables look like. And, and as we were standing there at the base, looking at these cables uh, that I would need to climb in order to get to the top, I began to have second thoughts, uh, not about my marriage, uh, but second thoughts about whether or not I really wanted to renew my vows on top of, I began to think, you know what, maybe it'd be better if we just renewed our vows down at the campground, more people would be there, the kids could join us. Um, and I recognized in that moment that some of the people who were part of this uh, surprise ceremony were already at the top of Half Dome. I, I was committed, I needed to, uh, to make this climb. Now I share this with you because what I discovered, and I'm sure for many of you who've climbed it, you can maybe have a greater appreciation that what I had to do was hold tightly to those cables and just take another step and take another step and take another step in order to get to the top and experience what I experienced there, which was phenomenal. And I know for many of you who have been there, you know, it's just this incredible feeling being there on top of Half Dome and certainly uh, renewing our wedding vows even made it more special. But in order to get there and experience all that, I had to simply hold to those cables and take another step and another step and another step. And I share that with you because I believe that's the experience that's similar to what Jesus is talking about here in this passage about experiencing his freedom. He's saying, if you will hold to my teaching, and there's going to be times you question it. There's going to be times you look at it and say, you know what? <laughs> nope, I think I'll do something else. That, that there's times that the teachings of Christ can be very intimidating, can be scary, hard to, to trust. You might have questions about it. But I, uh, but I began to believe and put my trust in those cables. I was holding on to them. And they, uh, they helped me to get to the top and experience all that, that God had for me in that experience. Here's what I know. If we will hold to the teachings of Christ... It not only becomes evidence that we are truly disciples or followers of Christ, but it also allows us to know the truth and not just know about it, but to experience it, to know it in an experiential way, to know it in such a way that it begins to make us more like Christ. And it's then and there as we become new creations in Christ, having held to the teachings in such a way that we've come to be shaped by them, to experience them in such a way, to know them in a way that shapes who we are, then we can experience God's grace. We can extend God's grace to others. We can know what it is to be free. Now, I know that's a very different understanding than many uh, will acknowledge as part of the freedom and our celebration of our nation and the, and the birth of our nation. But as we talk about freedom, this would be an example, I think, of what it looks like for the early church to be devoted to the teachings of the apostles, to be devoted to the teachings of Christ, for us to look into God's Word and allow God's Word to begin to speak to us, to begin to shape us, that we become more like Christ. Not only were they devoted to the apostles' teachings and the teachings of Christ, they were also devoted to the fellowship of just being together with one another. The Greek word here is koinonia, and the idea is that not just that you're having some kind of dessert or donuts and 
uh, pie and coffee, but the idea is that you're experiencing relationship with one another in a life-giving way, encouraging one another. I can't tell you how many times uh, throughout these last several months, I've had people reach out to me just with a word of encouragement. Pastor, I want you to know we're praying for you. We want to encourage you in this time. And that those would be examples of fellowship, of koinonia, of experiencing hardship and challenges and difficulties together, but encouraging one another in the process. They were devoted to that. It was a priority. It was something that was important to them. And I would dare say in our day, we need more and more of that as well. Encouraging one another, devoted to the relationship and the fellowship we have with one another. They were also devoted to breaking bread together. We might think here of feasting. Uh, They had a love feast is what they would refer to it as, celebrating a feast about the love of Christ and uh, and what He's done for us. Certainly today, uh, we've had that opportunity. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to share in communion, to break bread together, and to experience what it means to not only be a part of a biological family, but to be a part of a larger family of God that we are indeed uh, God's people, God's family. And then they were devoted to prayer, devoted to finding time to pray. All of us have the same amount of time. It's what we choose to do with it. And I want to encourage you that the more we can become like the early church here and be devoted to these things, to be devoted to praying, praying for our community, praying for our leaders. We know there's many who are going to complain about our leaders. That's that's not the question. Uh, And we might choose to find all kinds of things to focus on and complain about. But what does it mean to take the time we would spend complaining and talking to others about what we don't like about our leaders and rather commit, devote some of that time to praying and talking with God, praying for our leaders, praying that God would somehow move in a powerful way in the lives of people, even as we deal with these challenges that are all around us. You see, if we're going to become like the early church, we too need to think about what are the things we're devoted to. And many times we can be more devoted to trying to get across our political opinion on a uh, social media platform rather than being devoted to having our faces in the Word of God so that our faces begin to reflect the presence of God into our community in powerful life-changing ways. May we learn from the early church and take steps to become devoted to the things they were devoted to. The second thing I think we can learn from them is not only uh, what it means to be devoted to these things, but to be determined to work with God regarding the mission of the church, the mission of Jesus Christ, that we are carrying on the mission of Jesus. And the reason I say it's going to have to be a determining uh, uh, is because it's not going to be easy. You see, the enemy is going to always be present. And the things that God's calling us to are not going to be things that we're going to do easily. They're going to be things we're going to have to be determined to do. For example, again, just to use the example, there are many in our culture who are determined to not wear a mask in the midst of these times. Now, I don't want to get into that, and I know even saying that can make it, I can begin to step into that controversy. My point is simply this. It's not really about mask or non-mask. The point is, can you see how determined we can be, how passionate we can be about some of these issues? And what would it look like if we had that same kind of determination, that same kind of passion for carrying on the mission that God has called us to as a church. You see, Jesus told us about an enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that enemy is certainly present in our culture as well. The devil's working hard, I believe, to distract us into things that simply aren't all that important. To divide us over issues that at some point I think we'll look back on and say, well, that was sort of trivial. (laughs) And to discourage us to the point that sometimes... We just simply give up and we stop trying. The devil's not going to stop doing the work that he's going to do, but we must be determined to keep our focus on the mission that God's called us to. You know, it was Jesus who said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Think about that, all authority. So whatever we're dealing with, uh, he has the authority. He's allowing these experiences. There must be a plan. There must be a purpose. We need to be determined to understand that better and to be in step with the power of God's Spirit to work out that plan. And he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even when you're not able to meet in your sanctuary and choose to meet at homes. I'm with you always to the very end of the age. 
me wrap it up this way. The determination we need is to understand this commission, this mission that God has given to the church through Jesus Christ. What does it mean to go? It means we're to focus on making disciples as we go, as we live out our lives. We don't wait for things to get better and say, you know what, we're going to go and make disciples when all this passes and we can get back in the sanctuary. No, we need to understand that this is the time we are going and making disciples. And let's be open to what it means for God to work in great ways in our house church settings in, 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 in this time when things are very different. He said, baptizing them. If we understand what baptizing is, really, I mean, it's about following Jesus. It's about submitting to Jesus. It's about surrendering to Jesus. When we're baptized, it means we're taking a step to follow Jesus. Sometimes I hear people say, I want to follow Jesus. I just want, I don't want to get baptized, right? I'm like, I'm not sure that makes sense. That's like saying, I love God. I just hate people created in God's image. I'm not, you know, John would later say, nope, <laughs> you can't say that. You can't say you love God and hate your brother. So all of a sudden we recognize that following Jesus, baptizing represents submitting to Jesus, following Jesus, indeed, um, holding on to his teaching. And then he says, teaching them to obey. As we think about what it means to teach others to obey, I would suggest to you the best way to teach others is to let them see the example in us. And I know that's a higher bar, it's a challenge. We would prefer just to be able to speak words, but I believe in times such as this, we need to live out the word in such a way that people can see the teaching of Christ in us. We lead by example. We teach what it means to be a follower of Christ as people are able to observe our lives and our love for one another. And then that promise to know that Jesus is with us always. Indeed, as Scripture says, a very present help in times of trouble. In that passage in Acts chapter 2, it concludes in verse 47 by saying, They were praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. I want to leave you with this thought. What does it mean to enjoy the favor of all the people? Well, certainly in their day, we understand that the big division was over Jew and Gentile. And it wasn't enough just for them to enjoy the favor of those who were like them culturally, but to be able to enjoy the favor of all the people. In our day, maybe the best way to begin to apply that in today's world is to put it this way. They loved all the people, those who wore masks and those who chose not to wear masks. And, and they found a way to overcome those issues by simply following, holding on to the teachings of Jesus and making a devoted effort to embrace those things and to be determined now, you know what? We're going to keep our focus on the mission of Jesus Christ, that that's what's going to be important, loving our neighbor as ourselves. May we as a church, as we meet together these coming weeks in house church settings, may we be devoted to God's Word, to fellowship, sharing meal together, breaking bread together, praying together. This week, we encourage you to pray for first responders throughout our community as we seek to minister in this way to them. And may we hold to the teaching of Jesus coming to know the truth that begins to shape us to become more like Jesus so that we can experience the grace of God in our own life and extend it to others for the honor and glory of God. May God bless you and your family, the house church that meets at your house as we celebrate the freedom that we have in Christ. We'll see you soon. Well, thanks again for joining us this morning. If you have any questions about anything Pastor Bob said or, or just wondering what's going on with things at the church, please reach out to the church office either by calling, by texting the number provided, or, or emailing us. We'd love to come alongside you and minister to you in any way. So if you have any prayer requests, please reach out to us as well.